Coming up on this week's show, audiobook narrator John Solo joins us to talk about his performance in my book, Tracker Hacker, and we'll learn how he became a voice actor. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome, everyone, to episode 168 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I am Will from WillKanaus.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Mr. Jeff Adams. Hello. Welcome, everyone, back to our very special, well, I was about to say very special (laughs) Christmas Eve episode, but it's like pretty much a standard episode. It is. It just happens to be dropping on Christmas Eve. Hope everybody's having a wonderful holiday season, hopefully full of good books. We've certainly enjoyed the holiday reading that we've done uh, this year, and uh, the reading in general for December, I think, has been pretty darn good. So hopefully you're able to de-stress, perhaps, with some good books, or that maybe you're just not having a stressful holiday, which would be awesome. In the Hockey Player's Heart, the feel-good gay romance by Jeff Adams and Will Knaus, Hockey star Caleb Carter returns to his hometown to recover from an injury. He never expects to run into his one-time crush at a grade school fundraiser. Seeing Aaron Price hits him hard, like being checked into the boards. The attraction is still there, even after all these years, and Caleb decides to make a play for the school teacher. You miss 100% of the shots you never take, right? Aaron has been burned by love before and can't imagine what a celebrity like Caleb could possibly see in a guy like him. Their differences are just too great. But as Aaron spends more time with Caleb, he begins to wonder if he might have what it takes to win the hockey player's heart. Get the hockey player's heart in ebook, paperback, or as an audiobook performed by me, Finn Sterling, wherever you buy books. So before we get into some of our Christmas reading for this week, I want to talk about a, a non holiday book. Uh, I completed this week the 20-hour audiobook epic of Raven Song by T.J. Klune, uh, as read by the awesome Kurt Graves. Uh, Raven Song continues the Green Creek stories, uh, which is the the story of the Bennett Werewolf Pack who live in Green Creek, and their witch who is Gordo, who we met in Wolf Song. Um, this particular book. Is so hard to talk about. I'll just say that up front. So if I start to stumble, which I often do anyway, is because I'm trying to navigate around uh, spoilers, which I do want to avoid. Uh, Where Wolf Song was the story of Ox and Joe and their coming together to be mates. Uh, This is a story of Gordo and Mark, who have a much more uh, (laughs) complicated, very complicated relationship. We saw some of that play out. Uh, in Wolf Song, as they, uh, as Gordo really didn't want to deal with Mark, and Mark kind of uh, really wanted to deal with Gordo a little bit, but they didn't quite find their way to each other. Here we learn of their tumultuous past, uh, where they met as teenagers, and uh, very similar to how Ox and Joe played out, Mark really wanted to uh, connect with Gordo early on, gave him his stone wolf. Uh, But then things got complicated when the Bennets had to leave Green Creek and left Gordo behind, even though he was already their witch. Um, All of this, I love what TJ's done here because Ravensong not only shows us what happened in Wolf Song itself from Gordo's point of view, we get to see things that are earlier in the Green Creek timeline for when Gordo and Mark first met. Uh, when the Alpha was Thomas's father, Abel. So we see a whole bit of history there, and then we go far forward uh, from the events that we saw in Wolf Song as well, uh, which only make the entire story richer now seeing it from this other point of view. Um, the overall, besides Mark and, and Gordo are trying to sort themselves out and finding their way back to their own personal happy, happily ever after here, uh, the Bennett Wolf Pack continues to be under attack from various sources. Uh, the big bad here, uh, there's a couple of them actually, but the one that really plays out is uh, with a hunter who is coming for the pack to finish something that she'd started years ago. Um, I have to say that she's she's an evil badass. She's, she's an interesting character, but she is a badass and she 
she she rains down all kinds of fire on Green Creek, which is is really unfortunate, but happens anyway, and really um, shows TJ's ability to really create action scenes, uh, which we also saw with the way that he wrote The Bones Beneath My Skin. Uh, but it also shows how all of that uh, he uses to great emotional turmoil as well. All of that said, there's also a, an amazing amount of humor in this story because the other people we start to see a lot of are Godo, Gordo's friends, uh, Rico Tanner, Chris, and Jesse. Uh, they all became uh, human members of the wolf pack in Wolf Song. And here we see how Gordo connected with these goofy guys and, and girl and how they evolve through the story from Wolf Song into Raven Song. I will say in particular that Rico has no filter. He doesn't really know when to not talk and what not to say to great humorous effect. Sometimes I think it's because he's scared and he's just spouting off things to say to help break his own tension. But sometimes the guy just doesn't have a filter and it's absolutely hysterical. And uh, his humor comes up and it's sometimes the best of points. And then also sometimes, as I said, it's just him being kind of goofy. Uh, this book also continues kind of the whole found family and becoming more than you're told you're going to be. Um, Ox in the first book was always told by his dad that he was never going to amount to anything and that people were always going to give him shit. And then he evolved into the man that he became uh, because of his time with the Bennett pack. Uh, Gordo has some of the same issues with his family. And certainly his father, who was the original Bennett Witch, uh, continues to cause problems here. And it's clear he's going to become kind of a key uh, found point in the next book in this series, uh, which is called Heart Song, which is supposed to come out in September of 2019. Um, Kurt also does an amazing job in this book, balancing the humor and the anguish and the action and a ginormous cast of characters. Um, he does, yeah, it's great. I love everything about Raven Song by T.J. Klune. I did a fast follow-up on this book, too, and listened to Kurt read the short story Love Song. Um, if you remember back in October at GRL, uh, Kurt and T.J. announced the Love Song podcast. The first two episodes of that are Kurt reading uh, Love Song, which is from Elizabeth's point of view. She's the matriarch of the Bennett Pack. Uh, and it goes all the way back to her meeting Thomas, uh, her husband who we met in Wolf Song, and goes all the way through uh, the events that are in Raven Song. So you can't, I don't really, you really should not read that if you have not read the other two books. Um, again, a great job by both author and voice actor here. Um, Elizabeth, you know Elizabeth has had a rough and upsetting life, and you really see that um, as you get everything from her point of view in Love Song. Um, so yeah, I, I, I enjoyed my time at Green Creek. It was an emotional, uh, tremendous roller coaster, and I can't wait to get to Heart Song in 2019. Shall we kick off on some Christmas books? So the first Christmas story I want to talk about this week is A Cowboy's Christmas Luck by K.C. Byrne. Um, this story came across my radar earlier in the week. I think it showed up in my like social media feed. And the, uh, of course, the cover, which is really pretty, um, attracted my eye. And I haven't read a cowboy book so far this season. Uh, plus, the story takes place in Vegas, so I thought that was a little different and interesting. And I'm really glad I gave this story a try because I loved it to pieces. <laughs> Need I say more? That's no, like, okay. That's, that's like my review. No, I'm kidding. Shall okay. I just move on to myself? <laughs> no, I'm not done yet because this is the first story that I've ever read by Casey Byrne. Um, Casey's been writing for uh, quite a while now, uh, and we've run into her like once or twice at GRL. And mm -hmm. um, I'm really glad that this is the first story of hers uh, that I've read. Um, if this is any indication of the quality of the rest of her work, I will definitely be reading more Casey Byrne books. Byrne books? Say, say that five times fast. Indeed. In, <laughs> I will definitely be reading more of her books in the future. So, A Cowboy's Christmas Luck is about Jonah. He is a down-on-his-luck cowboy, uh, essentially stranded in Vegas. Uh, he has been, you know, spending the past year following the circus, 
the circus. The circuit. Circuit. The rodeo circuit, uh, which culminates in Vegas every year. Uh, and he spent the year under the impression that um, all the work he was doing was going to lead to a job and possibly a romance. Uh, but that does not end up happening. He gets kicked to the curb uh, and he's sad during Christmas. <laughs> um that is when he runs into Zach. He is a nice guy television writer from L.A., and he is in town uh, during the rodeo, uh, kind of like soaking up some of the cowboy flavor, and uh, he ends up sucking up to... <laughs> I was about to make a really crude comment about... I was looking forward to that. <laughs> I won't... This is... <laughs> We'll keep this nice and PG. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely Christmas I've story. already stuck the E on the episode. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, um, Zach runs into Jonah and there is like instant chemistry and they end up hooking up right away. And this is one of those stories where the characters di- get together at the very, very beginning and then, then spend the rest of the story kind of... Um, getting to know one another and then falling in love uh not like vice versa uh, and i really enjoy those stories and i really enjoyed this one because jonah and zach are two very nice guys and as they like spend the next couple of days together um we learn more about them uh in the same way that they're learning about each other uh they like go out to eat and they hang out and they like go watch the fountain at the bellagio all those sort of like normal vegas things And the tension and conflict in the story comes from the fact that uh, although they're enjoying each other's company, uh, there's sort of like a ticking clock. This isn't going to last forever. They're eventually going to have to go back to their, you know, regular everyday lives. And for Zach, that means going back to L.A. And for Jonah, he really has got nothing. He's got no job prospects anymore. So... As the talk clock is like ticking down, um, Zach is essentially stayed in town because uh, some friends of his from L.A. are going to be uh, getting married over the weekend. So Zach asks Jonah to accompany him, uh, which he does. Uh, and thankfully, that leads to a new job opportunity in L.A. and they live happily ever after. Um, As I mentioned, the story is about Jonah and Zach, and they're two genuinely nice guys. And I think that's sort of been a theme for me the last couple of Mm -hmm. months. Um, Just really enjoying nice, kind, good people who are falling in love. Um, (laughs) That's all all that I need in my fiction right now. (laughs) Because, you know, the shitstorm that has been 2018, um, that's really all that I can cope with. (laughs) So, uh, if you are into nice guys and cowboys in Vegas, I highly recommend checking out Casey Burns' A Cowboy's Christmas Luck. Cool. I'm going to take us down a completely different holiday path now. How different? Very different. So, one of my favorite Christmas uh, specials is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, because who doesn't like Rudolph? And this particular story, Sugar Cookies and Computer Code by Chris Jason, who is a friend of the podcast and a writer that I quite adore her work, she's, she's put this story essentially set in the North Pole, and we've got uh, an elf named Tandy, and his father happens to be the head elf. Tandy, uh, he's actually been working to refine the computer code that manages the naughty and nice list because he notices that's a little out of date and, you know, things could be processing better. Upgrade. Upgrade. And he's pulled away from this work because his father is going to send him to the Island of Misfit Toys for the annual Misfit Toys census because that factors into the adoption program that happens because they try to place these misfit toys with children. Um... He doesn't want to go there. He wants to work on his code. He doesn't want to deal with the census. But when he gets there to do the census, he meets L, which is short for Elmer. And Elmer's a teddy bear whose heart was broken years ago when his child gave him up. Uh, The child had been bullied for carrying the teddy bear uh, to a sleepover. And when he got back from that sleepover, he gave the teddy bear to mom and told mom to get rid of the bear. Uh, because he couldn't have it anymore. And so that brought L to the Island of Misfit Toys. And he has escaped the the census every year because he doesn't really want to go and have his heart broken again, uh, landing with another child who might um, cast him out again. 
Tandy and Elle meet uh, at Elle's bakery. Elle has apparently become a master baker in the years on the island. Uh, all the other citizens of the island love his baked goods. And uh, Tandy discovers that not only does he like the baked goods, he also happens to like Elle. And these two hook up, essentially having a one-night stand because they can't quite figure out how to get together uh, after that. Uh, Elm, um, Tandy goes back, turns into the census, goes back to work on his code. Uh, Elle continues his work at the bakery. What Elle really wants is not only to somehow end up with Tandy, but also to become Santa's head baker, uh, both of which seem quite unattainable. Of course, this being a, a, a romance, um, they, they do find a way to get there happily ever after, uh, which is quite the nice uh, ending for this story overall. But I have to call out Chris here because she gave another happily ever after here that was one that was completely unexpected and really pushes this story into like the next level of happily ever after which i'm not going to spoil it for you because it's really nice and just made my heart just get all warm and fuzzy and all that stuff so this is a, a really short quick read and you really need to get into your holiday uh reading list it's sugar cookies and computer code by chris jason coming up next i want to talk about christmas angel by eli easton um this is a bit unique because this is the first story in the christmas Angel shared universe um, a series of books uh, by uh, seven different authors. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the very first book, and the books are all connected um, by uh, one single Christmas ornament. And the Christmas Angel is the story of that ornament. Uh, it takes place in uh, 1750 uh, in England. Um, this is uh, for people who have no idea of history like me, um, this is essentially <laughs> the Georgian period, which is like Jane Austen times. Hmm. Um, it's not like, you know, when when you say England and Christmas, I immediately think, you know, uh, Dickens. Yes. Just period. Victorian era. It's like, <laughs> so, you know, this is like before Dickensian. Uh, just for like historical reference sake. Anyway, so the story is about a guy named John Trent. He is a, a Bow Street runner. And I'm not sure how you pronounce that. I've heard of the bow or bow. I don't know. Hmm. Like I said, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I've heard of them before. Uh, but from the context of the story, the Bow Street runners were essentially uh, detectives and PIs before those were like a real, oh, a real okay. thing. Anyway, so one day, uh, as he is like, you know, going on a constitutional stroll through London, uh, he finds this Christmas ornament, uh, a angel treetop floating in the Thames. And it's uh, really beautiful. Uh, it's intricately carved. Uh, obviously, someone um, undertook this project with a great deal of care and love. Uh, so he uses his deductive skills to... Uh, find who created the Christmas angel and he uh, finds Alec. He is a woodcarver. He's got a small shop in a, a upscale neighborhood in London and he returns the angel to uh, to Alec. Um, Alec originally carved this uh, ornament for uh, someone he cared deeply for uh, and that someone threw it away. Uh, so um, to to find the ornament like back in his possession uh, is a bit uh, a bit of a bummer for Alec. So he's like, "Thank you for bringing it back," and he puts it you know immediately puts it in the shop window, and he's just gonna sell it. He's like, "I don't want to deal with this anymore." So fast forward a couple of days later, uh, John is like doing his Bow Street Runner stuff, uh, and he comes across the angel again. This time he finds it discarded in an alley, and he's like, "What the heck is this about?" So he <laughs> takes he takes the angel back to the shop and goes, "Look, Alec, look what I found again." Uh, apparently, someone saw the angel in the window and bought it. Uh, and apparently it was lost again. But since it was found by John, Alec goes, you know what? It is obviously meant for you. You can mm -hmm. have it. Um, so he's incredibly touched by this. And using his deductive skills, he wants to uh, find out 
who and why originally discarded this angel in the first place. Uh, so uh, that leads him to Lord McDouchy Pants, um, <laughs> who, who's like the absolute worst. He is the guy who was like having a bit of a fling with Alec, and uh, he's absolutely horrible and like spurned Alex's affection and uh, obviously didn't care for this. Um, uh, the angel is essentially a uh, symbol, symbol of the, the feelings and the relationship Alec has with this guy. And he just discards it. So rude. He's a terrible, terrible person. So when John like learns of Alec's backstory, essentially, he falls for him even more. He's like, first of all, he understands that Alec is not only, you know, a very talented sculptor, he's obviously a super nice guy, and he feels things very deeply. Uh, also, uh, because, you know, in a historical context, he realized, oh, Alec is the kind of guy who, you know, loves in the way that dare not speak it in his name. So <laughs> he sets about wooing him. He shows up every day at the shop, you know, around lunchtime. Maybe he brings him a little, like, mince pie because he's, like, busy during the Christmas season and doesn't have time to eat. And he comes up and he checks in on him and he spends several days doing this. And Alec is sort of like, you know, well, okay, I like seeing him, but, you know, What's his deal? Why is he doing this? I'm not some damsel that needs to be, like, you know, courted. <laughs> of course, he's, like, not telling him not to come by. <laughs> um, eventually, John invites Alex to his boarding house for uh, a sort of a Christmas Eve dinner. Everyone in the house gets together and um, shares a meal uh, and, like, sings carols and all that sort of Dickensian crap. Um, what's really, really wonderful is is that the members of this boarding house are sort of like a found family. It is like a Georgian era Barbary Lane. Oh, it is cool. so it's so sweet and so funny and so charming. And I absolutely fell in love with uh, you know every single member of of this sort of like eccentric family that John has like, you know, become part of. And when uh, um, Alex, uh, you know, Alec arrives there and spends the evening with all of them, he realizes that, you know, you can, you know, be true to yourself and find love at the same time. So they end up spending the night together and it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, the next day, Christmas morning, uh, Alex sort of like sneaks out of the house uh, to go back to his shop so he can like change his clothes and get all gussied up for Christmas Day. And he also wants to like, you know, maybe bring back a, a few gifts for his new friends. Unfortunately, Lord McDouchy Pants shows up and starts trying to create problems. Uh, but thankfully, John, using his, you know, Bow Street Runner spidey sense, um, <laughs> arrives just in time to save Alec and send McDouchy Pants on his way. Uh, so it's... I, I can't express how much I really, really enjoyed this story. Um, I think it's a wonderful way to start this series. Um, all of the books in the Christmas Angel series can be read as standalones, but I think understanding the, the backstory of the ornament that sort of like uh, ties everything together uh, is really wonderful. Uh, this is a super charming story, super sweet, super romantic. Uh, once again, two really nice guys that I absolutely fell in love with. Um, I highly recommend everyone check out Eli Easton's Christmas Angel angel awesome i also visited the christmas angel universe this year reading rj scott's christmas prince why did i pick this one out of all of them well i do love me a prince story <laughs> as has been you know proven often on this show and also with my choice of hallmark channel movies at christmas time uh, and i like rj scott in general and, and her books um this one takes place in a more modern time um, I was bad and did not know what year this actually happened in, but it's it's more modern. Um, well, it's worth <laughs> noting that um, each of the stories in the Christmas Angel series take place in different time periods. Mm -hmm. 
um, so that we learn about the the magic of the Christmas angel uh, in like you know through the, the decades through the de- essentially yes that's that's what what we're going with yeah. so I read the first book and Jeff. Uh, read book number seven, which is essentially set in modern day. Modern day. Well, there you go. He knows more than I do. And I liked hearing your review because it does give me the context of the angel yeah. uh, and where it came from and to where it is found here. Uh, this particular book centers on Prince Raphael and historian Mark. Uh, they meet at an auction. Uh, Mark is charged with getting a box of items for the museum that he works for. Uh, This box contains several journals, some Christmas ornaments, including the Christmas angel. Uh, It's a big deal for Mark because this is the first time that he's been allowed to go to an auction, not really on his own, but where it's it's his responsibility Mm -hmm. to decide how much to spend on this item Mm -hmm. and to make sure that the museum secures it. Um, the prince is there uh, because he is recovering some items that uh, really have an origin in the country of Montanoint, which I think I'm pronouncing correctly. Um, he gets the items that he's after, but then he decides to bid on this box. Um, initially, he's trying to do this as a way to flirt with Mark. Uh, Mark doesn't perceive it that way at all. Um, and he's also, because he's not uh, really savvy in the ways of the auction, he jumps the bid way too fast, so there's less give and take, and the prince ends up with it, which he didn't really want either, because now he's got this box of stuff that he wasn't supposed to come back with. <laughs> um, so they've both screwed up, uh, and there's like a screaming match that goes down in a restroom after the auction happens, because the prince is like, why did you do that? And, the, and Mark is like, well, why did you do that? Uh, which is completely adorable in a in a the guys are flirting but they don't know they're flirting kind of way. <laughs> um, to help make up for all this, the prince uh, essentially hires Mark uh, to come to Montanoit to help curate a new uh, museum that's being built, uh, kind of connected to the castle, because uh, the prince is like the caretaker of. Uh, Montanoid's history so he's really trying to do right by his country yeah. and and by the monarchy to build this museum and he thinks Mark is the right guy to help curate it um, this is not a true forced proximity story and yet there are elements of forced proximity here because uh, Mark isn't really given a team of people to work with mm-hmm. he's given the prince to work with and they are working in tight quarters very often around the place where they store all these artifacts in their carefully climate controlled space. So they're in there a lot together um, as all of this... Together in the dusty catacombs. Uh, not really catacombs, but yes. I mean, <laughs> they're stuck in their spot to, to try to make this exhibit. Uh, but they also have other interactions Um he introduces Mark to his family. He Mark comes to Christmas dinner. Um, his family adores him already, uh, particularly uh, Raphael's sister, Alice, kind of like nudges the two together. Mm-hmm. But there's the Christmas angel who's also kind of nudging this mm-hmm. together because there's a little mystical, magical yep. something, something that goes on with the angel uh, to kind of nudge them closer and closer together. And of course... This being a delightful holiday story, they do end up finding that happily ever after. Uh, but I love how they get there because even as things are starting to go right, there's a little snippy snippy going on there because, you know, Mark feels he's been brought here under um, not exactly the most uh, forthright of circumstances, even though the prince really wants this exhibit to happen. Um but as they figure it out, they're they're so freaking adorable together, even while they're having their flirty, snippy arguments. <laughs> but when it really starts to click and the angel works her magic, it just, it's so squishy good. I mean, RJ, this, this could be a Hallmark movie. And I know RJ loves the Hallmark movies as well. Um, and I could definitely see this be her entry into them at some point because it's so good. So I highly recommend Christmas Prince uh, by RJ Scott. 
Now, if you're interested in any of these stories, uh, all you have to do uh, for links is go to the show notes page at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. If you're interested in helping to support this podcast and would like more information, all you have to do is go to Patreon.com slash BigGayFictionPodcast. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash BigGayFictionPodcast. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at Facebook.com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast and see what we get up to next. As I mentioned on last week's show, the audiobook for the first installment of the Codename Winger series, entitled Tracker Hacker, finally dropped on Audible. Uh, and I mentioned that I had the opportunity to talk to John Solo about it, who because he is the voice actor uh, on the book. Uh, I listened to the whole thing because I wanted to hear Theo come to life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I jumped on it as soon as I could get a hold of it. Um, I adore what John's done with this book. He really captures Theo's excitement at being an agent, um, the angst and and occasionally lack of confidence that he has as he gets into his first field mission um, and what it means to kind of balance his life as a secret agent versus just trying to be a normal kid hanging out with his boyfriend and his friends. Uh, so I really enjoyed the opportunity to talk to him about not only Tracker Hacker itself and because this is his first YA book so we'll talk a little bit about that in the interview but also to find out more about his backstory because he is the uh, the founder of Falcon Sound Company which uh, handles a great number of MM romance books especially for Dream Spinner and John himself has voiced more than a hundred books I mean that's a lot of books mm -hmm. to do my goodness so it was a tremendous opportunity to get to talk to John and uh, shall we get to that yes sounds good Welcome, John, to the podcast. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this all week. It's going to be a good time. I've got my coffee. I'm ready to go. I have mine, too. <laughs> yeah, Early morning yeah. for both of us. Yeah, but Although I have a Star Wars. already been in the booth for three hours before we've even started talking. Yeah, it's been a, uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a long morning already. That's December for you. It's all right. Um, it's been a ton of fun this morning, but my voice is already a little rough. Uh, so sorry about that. I think I'm going to take a nap after this. Oh, there you go. That's the perfect bridge between the, the first three hours and the second three hours. Yes, sir. Reset the voice. So we have audiobook author uh, <clears throat> narrators on relatively routinely on the show these days, but we definitely wanted to reach out to you because you've done the audiobook for my YA book, Tracker Hacker, which is the first book in the Codename Winger series. Uh, as we talked about before we started recording, great job. I'm, I'm I was a geeky author and had to listen to how it all played out and how Theo sounded on audio. <laughs> Thank you. And that was a ton of fun to do. Uh, as we were talking before, I, I would, I would love to be able to, I hope we get to do the second one here. It's a, it was a ton of fun. Theo was a blast. Um, even though, you know, he's, uh, there was a large cast. <laughs> there was a lot of people in this book, but every one of them were so much fun to voice. Um, and really, I'm, I don't have any reason to blow smoke at this point. Uh, this was a good book. It really was. I, I recommend any, any of my people that are watching this and maybe haven't seen Jeff yet or, or read any of Jeff's work. This was fantastic. It really was. Um, and even, <clears throat> even if you're not into YA, that sort of thing, it was just a fun story all the way around. It's spy stuff. It's cool. You'll like it. Well, thank you for that. I may just take that and use that in the commercials. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you mentioned before we were recording that you treated it a little bit like a superhero almost because in a way he he is because of his computer skills kind of that superhero and you likened him i think to batman a little yeah, bit yeah yeah he, he doesn't actually have superpowers but it kind of feels that way at times in the book he's he's doing a lot of cool spy stuff and it's uh um he, he's from a spy family it, it kind of reminded me you know, like the incredibles kind of feel where the whole family's in on it um but so I, I treat a lot of the voices as I would like a, a superhero kind of book. And that made it, you know, I can't always go over the top with my voices. In this book, it felt a little bit more permissible. I don't know. I got to admit, I didn't ask you, <laughs> but it, but it, it felt worked. permissible to me at the time. Uh, I could go a little bit more over the top, stretch it a little bit. Um, and that's what made it so much fun for me. Um, I looked forward to sometimes when you track in an audio book, you're like, oh, that guy again. 
All right. <laughs> You're pulling up the voice, sighing deeply. That didn't happen in this one uh, because every voice was just a ton of fun to do. I got to be creative. It was it was cool. Um, and especially uh, the Defender Dad voice. He was my super... It, just stuff like that was so much. Thank you for the opportunity. It was a blast. <laughs> uh, you're very welcome. I'm glad it worked out. Um, now, you, you've you got like 100 books, over, maybe over 100 books as John Solo on Audible, which is yeah, you'd pretty mention, awesome. I, I thought I, I – we, we had talked about like once we get over 100, we should have a party. Uh, I don't remember having a party. I think it's time <laughs> so, for the party. Uh, I think so. And most of your books are in the in the romance genre. There's a lot of male male romance in there because you do a lot of Dreamspun Desires, a lot of work for Dreamspinner and other authors. It looks like Tracker Hacker is your first YA. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I was looking too. I think it is. <clears throat> it was a uh, and yeah, I I do a lot of uh, male male romance. Obviously, that's kind of the the John Solo thing. I've also been doing. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of impreg lately. Uh, there, there's a lot of that popping up in my in my catalog, uh, which is which is just another interesting spin on it. Um, but yeah, um, I think the closest I've come to this is comedy, uh, to be honest. Uh, but I I really haven't done a whole. You know, I have teenage characters pop up, but nope, nothing like this. You were my first. Um, I give you my cherry, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I am honored to take it. <laughs> Were there any particular challenges kind of approaching this book from what your other catalog is where you've got, you know, a 16 year old first person narrator with also several teens in its cast? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It turns out I'm not a 16 year old boy. Um, <laughs> it's like that, that video that pops up on Facebook all the time with Ian. McGee. So, yeah. So what I did was I acted like I was a 16 year old boy, uh, which is actually not too hard. Cause I remember being that, um, Yes and no. There was there was a couple scenes. I don't want to give anything away for people that haven't read the book, but there's a couple scenes where uh, there there's the guys on a hockey team and there's several hockey players getting together in a room uh, where I had to check my voices a couple times. Like, ooh, am I am I am I or do they sound like each other too awful much? Because um, you know, once you get more than three or four of them together, uh, you you know you kind of got to do some stretching. Um, other than that, though. Th this is a first person narration, which means I'm narrating in a voice. I'm not doing my voice, uh, which is always a little bit of a challenge. I've done it a lot. I'm pretty accustomed to it at this point. Narrating in the 16 year old's voice. Honestly, what I just had to make sure of was that I didn't get too tired. Um, I normally record for three to six hours a day, somewhere in there. Um, typically I land about four hours with this book. I could not track for that long because I'm mm -hmm. narrating in Theo's voice. So I would hit two, two and a half hours and I would have to take a break and rest for a while. Um, otherwise I started to sound like Theo had a, <clears throat> well, he wasn't 16. <laughs> the Theo started to sound like an old man. Uh, <laughs> But I think that was the only huge challenge and just making sure. No. And again, it was so much fun to do that I wanted to push beyond that. I do a lot of books now that are first person, but alternating perspectives. So you've got, uh, you know, the, the male, male lead and the other male, male lead and the male, male something like that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, you've got the two leads. So it's bouncing back for back and forth from chapter to chapter. Um, this was actually a breath of fresh air next to that <laughs> because I do it so much after a little while, you're like, wow. <clears throat> another voice. All right, let's, let's make it. Um, with, with this, it was just, it was kind of a breath of fresh air all the way around. Plus it, maybe that's the best way to describe this book. Uh, it felt fresh, new. Um, <clears throat> that's a great description of it. Cool. I'll take that one too. <laughs> <laughs> what got you in <clears throat> to audiobook narration some hundred books ago? Went down to the crossroads. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I started out as a musician. Um, I was a full-time musician for a long time, um, a, a vocalist and a guitar player and whatever they'd pay me to do. Um, I was fine. And, uh, I decided to discovered that, uh, the guy behind the mixing board made a heck of a lot more money than the guy on stage when you're playing in local bands. So I started to get into audio engineering, um, <clears throat> became a, a full-time audio engineer, uh, locally, nothing huge or anything. Um, but made a, a decent living at it. One night I'm, uh, running sound for a buddy's band in a club. I hadn't seen this guy in a long time. And he happened to mention a site called ACX. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I had a guy that was recording here another vocalist that had a, just a great voice, man. He sat here and talked to him and he, he could read the dictionary to me. I'd be happy. It was just that good. Of, so I, I started talking to him about it the next day and me, my, um, 
uh, me, me and him and, and uh, one of the, we, we all submitted auditions within a couple of days, not thinking anything of it. Why the heck not? None of us have ever recorded anything like this before. And within a week, we got three offers. Um, <clears throat> that was the start of it. A year later, uh, Falcon Sound Company uh, was at the time a full-time uh, live sound and lighting production company. Um, a year later, we were phasing out of live sound and, and recording audiobooks. Um, it went that quickly. And that was, I guess, FSC started five or six years ago. Um, I myself, as John Solo, have been recording um, for four, four and a half years now, somewhere in there. So it moved pretty quickly. So yeah, I started as a musician, audio engineer. Now I'm a voice artist. Um, and, and this is a pretty fun ride. I hope it keeps going. Uh, seems to be, I got a lot of work, so let's, let's hope. And we should note, you're also the owner of Falcon. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. I probably should have explained that. Yes. Uh, my, um, it, and anybody that doesn't, I'm it, John Solo is a pseudonym. I'm not really John Solo. I am, but I'm not, uh, um, <clears throat> but, uh, it, but I, I do own a Falcon sound company. We have a bunch of different narrators that work for us. Um, and my, my significant other is with us as well. We, we all work this, uh, together as a big conglomerate group. It, it works out nicely for a lot of reasons. One, it helps us, um, a client will approach us, a publisher, for instance, or an author, and they don't really know they've either never made an audiobook before or they haven't quite decided on a voice, we can give them multiple options. It's pretty simple. I can, instead of saying, uh, do you like my voice? I can say, which one do you like? Um, so it's worked out nicely for all of us. Um, and, uh, I don't know what else are you going to do on a Tuesday? <laughs> and it's actually, that's how I got to pick your voice is that, um, Andrew Gray, who runs the audiobook. Uh, production for <clears throat> Dream Spinner Harmony Inc. and Dream Spinner uh, Publications, mm -hmm. or, or DSP as it's called, uh, said, here are some narrators. <clears throat> Please listen to these and see what you think. And for me, it was like, who do I best think? Because I think I was getting samples that were all Dream Spun Desires at that point. Mm -hmm. And who do I, th and I had to think <clears throat> about who sounded the most like they could become a teenager. And yeah, when we, we load those samples up, that's actually... <clears throat> Very early on, after we got those first few books with with uh, Falcon, um, I, I was scrolling through um, ACX. It was the the freelancer site, <clears throat> and I saw a couple of Dream Spinner books, and I decided I was going to approach him. And he offered me one book, and I, I said, "No, I don't think you understand. I have this this uh, stable of people. At the time, the stable of people was three, and and one was a female, so I don't think that's going to work for their books." But um, he said, "Oh, okay," and literally within about a week I had 20 or 25 offers from him. <clears throat> and then I was scrambling. I was, I said, <laughs> like, what am I going to do with this? Um, so I started approaching some people I thought would be good at this. Um, uh, quite a few of the narrators that have done those books, we've actually started out. Uh, they were, they were not audiobook narrators before. Some of them had acting experience. Some didn't. And they used to all come and record at Falcon, which is a, uh, a detached building on my property. So, um, for the first couple of years, every day we had, I don't know, 10 people showing up at the, on my property through the course of the day. And then as technology has gotten better over the years, they've all started to move to recording offsite. At this point, it's just me at, 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 at this facility. Then everybody else records at their place. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, that was an interesting start. I think, uh, <clears throat> we ended up at one point in the very beginning with 10 or 12 of our, our guys working for us. Uh, none of which had any sort of, uh, uh audiobook narrating experience, uh, so we all learned a lot very quickly. <laughs> That's a very cool kind of evolution that you went from, you know, being live, <laughs> live, in, live engineering for bands to audiobooks in the span of about five years. This is so much cooler. <laughs> this really is. Don't get me wrong. I, and I, I still live engineer occasionally on the weekends, sometimes not nearly as much. I was doing about 140 gigs a year. Now I do about 30. So it's a mm -hmm. whole different ball of wax, but this is so much more fun, man. Um, I can Did do, you have acting in your background somewhere that not led to this? Little, I mean, I lied to girls occasionally. That was <laughs> 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 no, I, not one little bit. Um, I actually learned from the guys that I hired. Uh, I did a couple of those early books, but I wasn't narrating, uh, as much at all as the guys that came in and narrated for us. I was playing producer. Um, my background as an audio engineer, I, I did pretty well with that. Um, <clears throat> so we lucked out the first four or five guys that we brought in, uh, Nick J Russo, um, uh, Andrew McFerrin. He, he also works as Drew Baca, um, Peter B Brook, Finn Sterling. Um, 
I think that was our core group. And, uh, I think so. I'm, I, I know I'm missing a couple, but all of those guys are just incredible. <laughs> They're so good. And, mm-hmm. uh, they, they started out with just this knack. Um, in fact, I think Finn is the only one that actually had any acting experience. I think the rest of us were just kind of making it up on the spot. Um, but most of those guys that I just mentioned are still working regularly in, in the industry today. Mm-hmm. Um, most of them full time. They don't have day jobs. This is all we do. Um, and it, so I kicked back and produced their books and learned. Um, I listened a lot. I learned. I did a couple titles, but I think any, I don't know, I'm not going to speak for all the other narrators out there, but for me, I, I did not, I didn't get my legs at all under me until probably 30 or 40 books in. Um, sorry to all the people for the first 30 or 40 books. <clears throat> um, and I'm still, it's the amazing thing about this is you're still learning every project you're learning. There's always something new to learn, especially when I didn't go to acting school or, uh, so I'm, I'm learning constantly. I'm constantly researching. Um, it's, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, <clears throat> well, maybe the world, but I, I, I <laughs> but you know what I mean? It, it's a yeah. great, it's a great gig. It really is. What's your process for preparing a book and, and kind of how long for a standard size, let's say the 50 to 60,000 word book, which a dream spun desire usually sits around 50,000 and tracker hacker sits around 60. What's, what's the process for a book of that length? You might say they're formulaic. Um, yeah, for, for that, um, I'm going to do a pre-read first. That's my first read through. I I don't take any notes or anything like that. I want to read it as a reader would read it. And I want to get a general feel for the project. Um, I actually do that a lot on my phone now because uh, we're working so many projects that I'll, I I use that, uh, uh, text to talk thing on my phone. So, uh, I will listen to it as I, you know, if I'm running errands, that sort of thing, working around the house, I'll constantly have that in my ear, kind of doing my first read through or listen through to the book. Um, which by the way, uh, forced me to get some Bluetooth earbuds, um, because you do not want to be going through the drive through at a bank and forget to turn down your stereo on with some of the books that I record anyways, <laughs> that's, it's an interesting, but yeah, um, that's my first read through. Then I go through it again and I will, uh, specifically have a spreadsheet that I work from. I'll write down every character name. I'll write down the start number of the chapter. I'll write down who appears in each chapter and I'll have general voice notes, um, pertaining to each character. And I'll also have general notes on each chapter, uh, letting me know what, what's happening. A clip notes version, you might say. Um, then after that, I'm going to go in and, and record the pre-production voices themselves. Um, depending on if the client is going to listen to them or not, the author, the, the publishing house, some do, some don't, <clears throat> some, the ones that do, I, I will record my thought process along the way. Um, so, you know, if I'm doing, uh, let's say Theo's voice, I, um, if they're going to hear it, I, I, I like to let them know what I'm thinking. So I would go through and, uh, you know, he's, he's going to be younger. He's going to be about 16 years old. He's, He's uh, definitely going to be kind of, uh, you know, a little bit faster than my normal voice is going to be. So I'm going to speed it up a little bit. And this always reminds me of Fry from Futurama when I do that kind of voice. But as soon as I fall into it, it's there. Once I get it, I record what I need, which is the, the uh, we call it the rainbow script. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long, round arch, with its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. Then that little bit I have, and I kind of have a that for every character. So I have a an even playing field with the same text, and I can get their tempo, their pitch, and the accent they might have. Um, I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but that's that's how we came up with it at Falcon over the course of the years. So now I've got a spreadsheet happening. I know exactly what happens in each chapter. I know where the chapter starts and ends. I know what characters appear and I have voices for each one, um, which works out nicely. Like you have a series. So if I go into book two, I can reference my spreadsheet and my pre-production voices. And I have a good start on the next one to, to start rolling from uh, pre-production for a uh, 50,000, uh, maybe 10 hours. 12 hours somewhere in there to lock down pre-production and, and, um, <clears throat> we put a bit more time into that just to make sure that the rest of the project goes smoothly. And I'm, there are no surprises. I know everything that's going to happen. I know all my character voices and nothing's going to change. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully fingers crossed. Hopefully. We've <laughs> always heard the, the talk of the, the finished hour. So tracker hacker, for example, is about six and a half hours as a finished book. <laughs> On average, 
how how many hours go into a finished hour for you? Including well, there is two different stats you hear online about this. There's uh, some people who include their pre-production and some people won't. If I include my pre-production, you're looking at about six hours per finished hour, somewhere in there. If you don't, you're looking at closer to four, somewhere in that range. Um, but four, it typically takes me about two hours in the booth to record a finished hour. Um, sometimes less, um, but I, I round it up to two just to make sure. Um, then after that, typically about two hours of post-production work somewhere in there, maybe two and a half. And the rest goes into the pre-production work. Um, um, uh, really we've, we've, we've made some leaps and bounds here in the last year or two on our post-production, uh, which is very exciting. Some new techniques that I've learned. I was kind of working, we as Falcon, we're working in a vacuum until about a year and a half, somewhere in there ago. I forget when I decided to start looking that old, uh, that old internet thing, you know, uh, and g- getting on Facebook and I, I actually made a John Solo Facebook profile and I started to get into some of the forums with the other narrators and actors out there. Turns out there are a bunch of them. Um, Mm -hmm. And I started listening a lot. And I realized how inexperienced I really am. (laughs) Some of these guys out there, some of the guys that work for Dream Spinner um, doing books, I, I, um, I pale in comparison to these guys. They're amazing. They're really amazing. Uh, These guys are actors. (laughs) They really, they, they really know their craft. So I am at least smart enough to know that I'm not very smart. So I, I, uh, I, I will stay quiet and listen. And I've learned so much. Um, it's really improved our process dramatically. Um, good question, though. Thank you for asking. What type of books would you say are in your wheelhouse because of, of your voice and what you typically do? I do uh, comedy uh, well. Um, I'm proud of my comedy. Um, and people hire me a lot for high angst, man. Just... Um, you get the you get that military guy in there with that kind of they hire me for that a lot um and i i do it well i i that's what i'm told um what i really enjoy that i do well is comedy i really love to get into that um and i i every i drain every little bit of juice of comedy that i can out of a book <laughs> if i see a comedic line coming man i'm pointing that at 20 feet away <laughs> i i just love it um but yeah, th- those are the, the two things that I seem to get a lot. Um, and I, so I guess that means I do it well because they keep hiring me. Uh, comedy, high angst. Are there any books that you're particularly proud of that you might say to somebody looking to explore your work, go read this for a John Solo book? So uh, if anybody doesn't know, Jeff sends you questions in advance so you can look them over. It's like The Tonight Show or something. It's awesome. He has a green room in the back. Um <clears throat> you know, the, the catering sucks, but, um, yeah, no, you know, we try, <laughs> <laughs> you had, you had asked me this and, and I was like, what, 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 am, what am I working on this week? I don't know. Um, but yes, um, uh, Marie Sexton, I don't know if you've ever read Marie Sexton. Mm-hmm. Um, but she is one of my all time favorites. I just love her to death. Um, and she put out a couple books, one of which uh, it's a series that's coming out. Uh, the heretic, the heretic doms club series um one man's trash the first uh, first book in that i am proud of i think i think for maybe and it's a what is it 12 hours and two minutes of audio 20 or 30 seconds there i acted <laughs> it was i was i was actually getting into the, there's a there's a character that's been abused and he's had a rough background and i i actually melted down a couple times in the booth um that doesn't normally happen to me but i i and I explained to, uh, I guess her assistant producer, I'm not, I'm not sure what she, her friend, uh, who I work with, with Marie, I explained to her what had happened. And I said, I'm not sure if you're going to like this or not. And she ate it up and loved it. And the fans seemed to have as well. They really enjoyed it. I'm proud of that one. Um, <clears throat> and before I figured out that, uh, I, I have multiple pseudonyms, um, as we talked about earlier, my real name is John Bricker. I don't care if anybody knows it. Um, please, if you want to read my stuff, don't friend John Bricker, friend John Solo. Um, <laughs> cause I don't really accept friend requests with my real name anymore, but, um, John Solo is for all of my romance stuff and Jack Wayne is for my non-romance stuff. Um, and before I figured that out, I actually started a series. I really wish I would have done it as Jack Wayne, but I didn't know uh, and I'm very proud of it. It's called the, uh, Bubba, the monster hunter. Um, it's by a fantastic author. Uh, this is nothing to do with male, male romance, by the way. And I know this, what this show does, but you asked me what I'm proud of. Mm-hmm. I love this series. It is just out of this world fun. It's like, uh, Buffy, the vampire slayer meets Larry, the cable guy 
and it's just a ton of fun. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, it really, it really is just a ton of fun all the way around. Um, so yeah, it, if you're interested in John Solo stuff, don't go listen to that. There's not a single romantic moment in the thing. Um, but if you're interested in some of the other stuff that I do, and I'm scrolling here too, just to see if there's, I, I think if I was going to pick two things, those would be what I'd hang my hat on. Um, and by the way, that's another first person narration. Oh, here, one more, uh, for the, for the Miyama Romans crowd, uh, Smoky Mountain Dreams from Lita Blake, um, is also one that I'm very proud of. Speak of some slow burn, high angst. <laughs> that thing has got it in spades and it's a wonderfully written book. Just gorgeous. She has descriptions of scenes in the Smoky Mountains, um, that really made me feel like I was there. It was pretty amazing. Uh, she did a great job on that. Anyways. Okay. So three, three is enough for you. Very cool. And I'm going to have to check some of those out. I've always wanted, I've heard good things about uh, Heretic Dom's Club just overall. Mm -hmm. uh, and now to know it's one of your uh, proud of titles, I'm going to have to go pick that one up. Marie knocks it out of the park every time. She's she's one of my favorites. I have a narrator crush on her. <laughs> what do you read when you're not preparing <laughs> a book? Or is there time to read anything else? <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I, I have not read a, 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 a fiction book for pleasure in several years now. Um, I wish I could. One of my fans on, on the John Solo site sent me an ARC copy of a book the other day. And I was, I was like, you don't send this to me. I, when, when am I gonna, um, I'm not gonna uh, thank you, I guess. So she insisted. Um, <clears throat> but no, I, I really don't. Um, when I used to get time to read for pleasure, I, I really, I love sci-fi and fantasy. That's my wheelhouse. Um, I was that nerd kid that played D and D when I was a child. Um, I, uh, I'm wearing a star Wars t-shirt. My company is named Falcon sound company. John solo put it all together. I'm into sci-fi. Um, wow, I had not put that together, but <clears throat> I, I should have clicked those dots. Together somewhere. <laughs> not many people do. And when they do, they're like, Oh yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of a big sci-fi nerd. Um, I liked star Wars before it was cool to like star Wars. So, um, <clears throat> and so somebody yeah. needs to send you a big sci-fi MM romance to click all the pieces together for John Solo. Please, please, if somebody wants to do that, I, I'll give you a discount. <laughs> um, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> one of one of my favorite clients, uh, Susie Hawk, just sent me the twelve days of Christmas Star Wars socks. <laughs> and they're the best thing ever. I've seen those. <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing Darth Vader yesterday. I'm not, no, I don't. I wish I would have worn them today. <laughs> I had Yoda on the other day. Yeah, they're just wonderful. I love Susie to death. So knowing that things, you know, sometimes take a long time before Audible kind of gets them out into the, into the big world. What can you tell us about what you might have coming out, you know, in the near future? <sighs> well, let's see. I have to look at stuff for this because it's, it's been a busy month. Um, all right. Today I'm working on a Susie Hawk book um, called Secret in Houston. That's the third book in the uh, the Lone Star Brothers series. And uh, it's a ton of fun to do. Um, I'd imagine knowing Audible and the way it works around uh, the holidays, I'm betting that's probably not going to be till the first of the year before it actually hits. Um, after that, I have an Anne Katrin book this month called Mating of Convenience. It's the start of her new series. I have a, let's see here. Oh, John Hartness is on my schedule with another Bob of the Monster Hunter book. That's also under John Solo, and that's uh, called Shades of Grey. I have uh, Jeannie St. James. Um, she has a Selkie Prince. Uh, I think it's the second one in that series, if I remember right. And I also have several Dreams Spun Desires books. Fimfo Fatale and Two of a Kind are two more that are coming up this month for me. Um, it's a busy month. How do people keep up with you online? I think you mentioned just earlier in the interview that you, you set up the John Solo Facebook page, uh, within the last few months. Yeah. That's about, I'm, I'm sorry, folks. Anybody that likes to listen to John Solo, I am horrible at self-promotion. I'm looking at you. Um, horrible at it. Um, I do have my John Solo Facebook account. You can certainly keep track of me there. Um, we do have a Falcon Sound Company website that we haven't updated in a year. Um, but you can certainly get on there and we have our emails and everything. If you really want to get in contact with me, um, past that, uh, you know, coming soon to an audible page near you. Um, but if you need to get a hold of me, Facebook is probably the easiest way to go about it. I will say though, I've greatly enjoyed talking to some of the fans on Facebook. That is a new experience for me because I haven't personally done cons or anything yet or any, 
they don't let me out of here very much. Um, <clears throat> so talking to some of the fans on Facebook has just been a joy. It was shocking to me to know that some people actually enjoy what I do. <laughs> it was it was a great thing. Um, yeah. And I've really enjoyed that immensely. Uh, so, yeah. Anybody... And you mentioned, you mentioned that you're going to Eurocon. We are definitely going to Eurocon this year. Um, this will be the, uh, the first... Uh, my my first venture into a con and we're going to go overseas to do it so if we mess it up at least they won't know me here i guess um <laughs> we uh we have several clients that are going over there uh um uh i'll drop a couple names here just because again Susie hawk and Ankatrin bird and uh, anna weinhart um i know we're meeting all of them over there of course andrew gray with the dream spinner table andrew gray tells me that i'm going to be doing his reading for him this year um so he doesn't have to uh, he was very excited about that i don't know what he's gonna have me read yet um, actually I just finished up one of his books too, uh, the best worst honeymoon ever. Um, just wrapped that up a couple days ago and submitted it. So maybe you'll let me read that. Who knows? There you go. And uh, we're hoping you come to GRL in Albuquerque in 2019 perhaps as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's look, it might be a possibility unless that first con scares me off. We shall see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you're going a... to Euro pride con, please don't scare John. <laughs> yeah, please, please be nice. Don't feed the monkey and all that good stuff. I have a face for this booth. <laughs> People don't want to see this on a regular basis. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh but yeah that's that's where you can find me and uh, yes i can't cannot wait to go to europe i uh i've only been there once it's gonna be a lot of fun cool. well john thank you so much for hanging out with us and for bringing such good voice to theo in tracker hacker Thanks for having me. Once again, thank you to John for stopping by the show and kind of giving us a little like sneak sneak peek behind the curtain of what it takes to actually produce an audiobook, the books that we all love listening to. Yeah, it was really something to hear his process, his pre-production process, and even to hear a little bit of how he found Theo's voice. Really hearing him kind of slip into it for a little bit just mm -hmm. kind of gave me goosebumps <laughs> when he did it. It's like, wow, just there's Theo there for that moment. Uh, it was it was really great to talk to him. I've already downloaded uh, Smoky Mountain Dreams by Letta Blake uh, because of his recommendation inside the interview. And I have to say I'm a little nervous because uh, I know because of a, of a blog post that I did that John's actually got on his listening list the, uh, the audiobook that I did of Theo's Christmas Story. So I don't know how that's going to turn out, but, but we'll see what the, the pro thinks of the uh, the amateur's attempt at <laughs> reading a winger book. I'm sure it will turn out just fine. We'll see. <laughs> and once again, please remember that Tracker Hacker, the audiobook, is available wherever fine audio is sold. Yes, and there'll certainly be, of course, the link in the show notes for that. Yes, be sure and check that out. Okay, guys, I think that'll do it for this week's episode. Coming up next week in episode 169, we are going to wrap up 2018 with a look at some of our favorite things. Uh, also, we're going to try and look ahead to 2019 and some of the things that um, we've got planned and some of the things that we're looking forward to in the new year. Yeah, it's. I've already been kind of looking back at the books I've read this year to kind of get a handle on what I think some of the best of the best were. and. Mm hmm It'll be fun to do that episode. Yeah. Okay, guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to biggayfictionpodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube. I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.